home and at the track, fans witnessed one of the longest races in NASCAR history, reaching over 619.5 miles long at Charlotte Motor Speedway for the Coca-Cola 600. But that's not the only milestone that we reached in NASCAR because I think, just maybe, we might have witnessed the best Coca-Cola 600 in NASCAR history. This episode of Above the Yellow Line was delivered to you by DoorDash. Get more to your door with DoorDash. Make sure to use the promo code NASCAR30 to get 30% off your first order. Offer only available on new DoorDash accounts. Hey race fans, it's Taylor and welcome back to Above the Yellow Line, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series and I kid you not, I think I had the best weekend of my life when I was in Charlotte for the 600. Not only did I see the ARCA race through, the 600 race, but I also got to see the race shops, I got to meet some drivers, I got to meet some friends for the first time. So it was overall a fantastic week. I'm excited to break this race down for you because it, it is so different. I know you guys probably know this, but breaking down a race from the track and from your couch. Um, it, it's two totally different things, so actually having an at-track perspective of this race was not only super special just because of the pageantry that the 600 was, but just because it, it was quite honestly probably one of the best races I have seen. A little bit of a spoiler alert for my rating for this race, but regardless, let's just get into our Coca-Cola 600 results. Gonna be honest with you guys, after watching the race in person, I thought the win was going to Elliott, Suarez, Chastain, and then one by one, each of them was picked off. And then of course, the guy on the pole, Denny Hamlin, he was there when it mattered at the end and was able to capture this crown jewel win for the Coca-Cola 600. So not only does this capture win number two of the 2022 season, but this also technically means, we'll talk about this later, that Denny Hamlin has won all of the crown jewel races NASCAR has to offer. So congrats to Denny Hamlin and the 11 team at Joe Gibbs Racing on this win. The rest of your top 10 are as follows with Kyle Busch in second place, Harvick in third, Briscoe fourth rallying back from a little bit of a spin in the fourth stage. Fifth place was Christopher Bell also rallying back from some issues on pit road and on the track. Sixth place was Tyler Reddick. Seventh place was Ricky Stenhouse Jr. I gotta talk about Stenhouse and Michael McDowell who finished right behind him in eighth place. Both of these drivers have just captured their fifth top 10 of the season and it reaches a milestone for them. For Michael McDowell specifically, this ties his career best for a single season with the most top 10s. It ties his season last year in 2021 with five top 10s through the season and so far he's on track to beat it. So let's be clear, he's gonna beat it and make a career best for himself. And for Ricky Stenhouse Jr., this ties his 2018 season with five top 10 finishes. And the most top 10 finishes Ricky has in his career, I believe in the Cup Series in a single season is nine. So I actually do believe as well he is on track to beat that record this season so far. So congrats to those two on really excellent finishes at the 600. Then in ninth, we have Larson. In 10th, we have Alex Bowman. Now we gotta talk about our notable finishers outside the top 10. Harrison Burton, this makes his second top 15 of the season for a points-paying race, the last one coming at Kansas. Next, we have Ty Dillon in 13th position. I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is his fifth top 15 this season so far, and this is also with him at a brand new team, so I think he's over-exceeding what I thought he would do, which is, for me, obviously very good. So congrats to Ty Dillon on getting another top 15 finish. In 15th place, we have Ross Chastain. Now, he won the truck race, so I thought he was a shoe in to do really, really well on the 600 day, and he dominated most of the race. Unfortunately, though, on that first overtime restart, Austin Dillon, I guess fortunately for Austin Dillon, but then also unfortunately, he ended up getting a really, really big run going into turn four on the white flag. And we all kind of stood up from our seats and we thought Austin Dillon was going to take the 600 win, getting his second 600 win in his career, which would have been very, very impressive. And unfortunately it, it didn't work out and it caused a multi-car wreck involving Ross Chastain, giving him significant nose damage. So on that final overtime restart, he sunk like a rock. So. That was very unfortunate because I thought it was going to be a really good day for Trackhouse Racing, and unfortunately, that just wasn't the case. Finally, I have to give a shout out to Cody Ware with his third top 20 of the season, and then I also have to give a shout out to BJ McLeod for his second top 20 of the season. So congrats to those two on good finishes for the Coca-Cola 600. Let's look at the guys that did not finish this race because this is where things get very interesting. Now, 17 out of the 37 cars in the field, that's about 46% of the field, did not finish this race. And according to Joseph Sprigley of tobychristie.com, this makes the most drivers to not finish a race in Cup Series history at a non-super speedway track since Dover in 1991. If you're watching this episode, all the names in yellow did not finish this race, but I wanted to talk about a few notables here. 
Now let's talk about Daniel Suarez in the 25th position. Now, in my opinion, he had a better car than Larson most of the day. He also probably had a better car than his teammate most of the day. It was just a matter of getting track position that his pit crew kind of let him down on a little bit on those slow pit stops. But besides the point, let's go to a restart in stage four. On a restart in stage four, Briscoe got into Suarez. Suarez then ended up spinning, which spun into Chris Buescher. This is where that scary wreck happened, where Chris Buescher went spinning about four and a half, five times, and it actually happened like right in front of where I was sitting. I was sitting right by that North Carolina Education Lottery, um, kind of like painting, I guess, on the turf. So I got to see him spin and it was very scary. And I will say I've never been to a race where that sort of thing has happened. I've been to a race where wrecks have happened before. Don't get me wrong, but this was a totally different experience. People in the audience were actually screaming. I, I felt like everything went silent. I, my stomach started to hurt. And I will say this is a testament to the Gen 7 car and how safe it is because Chris Buescher, his window net went down very, very fast. But I will say it took them quite some time. I know they were making sure that he was safe to get that car turned right side up. I felt like it was 10 minutes. I don't actually know if that's accurate or not, but it felt like forever. So when he walked out of the car, we were all very relieved, but man, that, that was, a, that was a really scary wreck. Probably one of the scariest ones I will ever see when I go to a race, but my gosh, I'm just glad he was okay. And that was very unfortunate too, because Chris Buescher actually ran a really decent race kind of within the top 10 all night long. So Unfortunate for that team, also Brad Kozlowski wrecking out earlier in the race as well. So not a good day for RFK Racing as a whole, but I am glad that Chris Buescher is all right. So those are our results. Now let's look at our points. Let's start off with the above the line point standings, though. Now, if you don't know how this works, each week, myself, Adam, Lucas, Dom, Joseph, and Brandon Lowe, we each choose a race winning pick out of a randomized order. This week's mine was William Byron, and of course, that did not bode well for me. He was the first one out of our list, which means I only got one point. Then Brandon, he actually chose Kyle Larson. He got two points this weekend, getting him to a total of 34 points. So him and I are tied. Then Adam Lucas chose Kyle Busch and he finished the second best amongst our race picks. So he now has a total of 37 points. And finally, Dom Joseph, I don't know how he does this. I swear he's either right all the time. He knows everything. I, I do not understand this, but he chose the race winner after everything that happened during the 600, getting him an extra bonus point. So he would have only gotten four points out of this weekend, but because he chose the race winner himself, he also gets a bonus point. So five points adding to his total of 38 points. Now let's take a look at our playoff grid. Let's see how things are shaking up right now, because after the 600, there was a little bit of a shakeup in our playoff points. Obviously still Chase Elliott is leading the charge with one win. And then we have Chastain, Kyle Busch, Joey Logano, William Byron, Alex Bowman, Kyle Larson, Chase Briscoe, Denny Hamlin, Austin Sindrick, and Kurt Busch all with wins, all in the playoffs. That's how they stand. And then here's where things get really interesting. Ryan Blaney is now only plus 94 to the good. Last week, he had a lot more wiggle room to play with between him and Truex. And now Truex has closed the gap as he is plus 88 to the good. So, so because of that wreck that Blaney caused as he went down on the apron and washed back up onto the track into turn two earlier in the race, and also wrecked out a lot of really good cars, that caused him to lose a valuable cushion to the playoff point standing. So he's definitely going to have to get a win, I think, to secure himself because everything's really, really close in points right now. So that is how the playoff points stand. And I think it's also really important to note who is now below the cutoff line. Almarola has dipped below the cutoff line, while Reddick has risen above the cutoff line, plus eight to the good, while Almarola is minus eight. And I will say I'm also very shocked that Daniel Suarez is still very, very low under the cutoff line. I thought this weekend would have been a really good one for him to regain some points, especially because he won a stage, but I guess that that's just not the case. But those are your playoff points following the 600. We've looked at our results. We've looked at the points. Now it's time to look at our SRI performance MVP of the week. We have to start though on a negative with our LVP. And I have to say this was, this was tough to choose from. There are a lot of teams that did not really do that well at the 600 or they did really well and then lost it all in the end, such as Trackhouse, Hendrick Motorsports lost half their drivers. Uh, RFK Racing and Penske lost all of their drivers. And I will say what's ironic about that. I was wearing a Blaney shirt, a Penske jacket, and I had a hat signed by Busher and Kislowski. So I really did the ultimate jinx there. And I felt really bad because I was repping my guys from Ford and, and they're all, all of their guys got wrecked out. So I was very bummed about that. I will say though, everybody struggled on Sunday, but Joe Gibbs Racing and SHR were there when it mattered the most. But the, the guy that I chose as this week's LVP, though, is somebody who did really well in the Xfinity race and the truck race. I'm talking about Ryan Priest. He is this week's LVP. He finished fifth in the Xfinity race and 11th in the truck race. And I thought that experience would have really boded well for him going into the 600, but he only raced 16 laps after he did not finish under the time clock. So unfortunate for him because I, I thought he was going to have a really good run, but I guess we'll have to wait to see him next time he is on the track. Or at the moment has come to award the MVP of the week 
for the crown jewel race. Now, I could go with Denny Hamlin, who was there where it mattered at the end. I could go with Kyle Larson, who had to come back from multiple pit road issues. And because he had to come back from multiple issues when he shouldn't have, I can't give it to Kyle Larson. But from what I was able to see at the track, now I had a really unique perspective of getting to watch all of the action all at once. So I really dialed in on this driver because he was a freaking rock. And I'm talking about Daniel Suarez. Though, yes, his pit crew put him back a little bit in position, he was able to regain it and he was able to contend for the lead multiple times. I mentioned this earlier too, he was also able to out contend Kyle Larson for some of the runs. So I, I think that within itself, showing a strong car and also showing a really consistent race from Daniel Suarez and winning a stage means that he is this week's SRI Performance MVP of the week. All right, let's pump the brakes and go down the line presented by PFC Brakes. First topic we're going to talk about is this whole discussion on Twitter as to if Denny Hamlin has won all the crown jewels or if he has And We talked about this in the Twitter space following the race on Sunday. My thought is this. I, I, I do not know. On a technicality, yes, he's won the Coca-Cola 600. He's won the Daytona 500, the Southern 500. But there's one that he is missing, which is the Brickyard 400. Now, this is where the technicality comes into place for me. He raced during the time when the Brickyard 400 win was available to him, yet he was not able to win it. So that's why I lead towards no, but if we're looking at the current NASCAR standings, how everything is, that race is now gone. It is now the Indy Road Course, which I think is a little bit of a mistake, but that is totally fine. We're going to forget about that for a second. But for that reason, I, I think Denny Hamlin, I, I wouldn't say he's won all the crown jewels because he had the opportunity to win the Brickyard 400, unlike drivers like Chase Briscoe, who has not been able to race that Brickyard 400 race, or even Tyler Reddick, I'm thinking. But I, for that reason, I'm going to have to say no. I, I hate to say that and kind of knock Denny Hamlin there, but I just don't necessarily totally conform to the idea that he has won all of the Crown Jewel races. You're welcome to disagree with me, though, in the comments. I think this might be the first opinion that I've really shared on the show that might be like, whoa, Taylor, hold the phone. But if you disagree with me, let me know in the comments below. I'd be happy to hear what you all have to say. Another topic up for debate is if the Charlotte Oval deserves two dates instead of one. And I think we talked about this on the Twitter space a little bit that I hosted after the race. And I will say Dom Joseph made a really good point. I'm going to kind of summarize it a little bit here. But if we had two oval dates, what does that mean for the Roval? Is that race going to sell out? How is that race going to do? Does that mean that race leads the schedule? Because personally for me, I do really like the Roval race. But if I was only offered to go to two races a year after going to the 600 in person in a heartbeat, I would choose those two oval dates hands down over the actual Roval race. So I, personally, I think it's a bad idea if we have two Charlotte dates. Now, granted, though, I, I'm not sure if we're going to go back to Texas next year for the All-Star race or not, if we're moving it around. I'm not really sure. We talked to Marcus Smith during the tweet up, and he didn't say anything about the actuality of us going back to Texas, but he kind of hinted that he was trying to get the product of that race a little bit better, the fan experience better. So for me, I from what he said, it kind of – Hinton towards we're probably going to go back to Texas, but obviously that's not an actuality that is not confirmed yet. But if we were to go to the All-Star Race for Charlotte, I would say that would be the second date for the Oval Charlotte race. That otherwise, we would just go back to the Rubble. So I think if it was that way, I think adding two Oval dates would work. But if it was two points paying Oval races, I would say no, just because there is beauty in scarcity. And I think if you have that one Oval race for Charlotte, it's going to sell out very fast. And especially with it being the 600, being super prestigious, I think we have to keep it that way. So in my opinion, we got to keep that one Oval date and that one Rubble date on the NASCAR schedule. The last topic up for debate here goes into our race rating just a little bit, not totally, but it has to do with the topic I talked about last week regarding Marcus Smith's comments on the fan experience and how that, in my opinion, kind of related to how fans like the racing product itself. Here's what I have to say based on my experience at the 600 and if my experience that whole week impacted how I thought about the race itself. I'm really excited to get a vlog together for you guys about my fan experience from the crazy tents that were outside the track with really old merchandise that I, I bought way too much from, from my time at the Hall of Fame to the race shops and everything in between. I'm really excited to get that experience out to you guys. And that being said, like I've said many times, this was the best weekend of my life. I absolutely had a blast. And because of that, I will say it is very, very true that that kind of impacted the way I thought about this race. I, I, I am a little biased towards this because I had such a good time. Granted, though, the product we saw at the track in itself was stellar. Like, the, I remember the race last year for the 600, and it, it just, it bored me to death. Like, and this time being at the track, you would have thought I would have been tired. Yes, I was tired, of course, but I know we raced over the 600-mile mark, and I wanted it to keep going. That, that should say something to you, and I don't know if you felt the same at home or not, but 
being at the track, I wanted the racing to continue because it was so cool seeing how hard these drivers were pushing. And yes, the chaos kind of added to the excitement. I will admit that. But overall, the product itself at Charlotte, kudos to everybody who put together this Gen 7 package, the, the track, who conditioned it. Every, everything was just perfect. So though my experience does kind of give me a little bit of a bias towards how the product was on the track. I feel like I can separate the two and say the racing itself was fantastic and my experience was fantastic, though I will admit one influenced the other. With that said, let's go into our race rating above or below the yellow line on Twitter. I had a poll and here's what you had to say. For the Coca-Cola 600, 80.3% of you ended up saying this was a great race. 13.5% said good. 4.7% said okay, and 1.6% said bad out of 319 votes. So thank you all so much for participating in this race poll. More specifically, here's what you all had to say. Lucas said meh, it was okay. Definitely not what they hyped it up to be. We also got comments from Elite Precision 29 and Josh B saying that this was the best Coca-Cola 600 ever or probably since 2011. James says it was a very competitive race. A lot of the cars looked equal. In the end, four tires were the way to go. I wish NASCAR would bring back the fall oval race much better than the Roval. And that I'm not sure. I do really like the Roval race. So fighting words there a little bit, James. And finally, Ashley said it was so good. Excited to finally see Denny win it. First off, props to every journalist, media member, driver, pit crew, crew chief, track personnel, any anyone who made this event possible pretty much. Thank you, because it was a very long day. Some people were up since maybe three in the morning, and then they stayed up until three in the morning the next day getting work done. So thank you to all of you for your very hard work. I appreciate it as a fan and as somebody who's trying to get into the industry themselves. So thank you. And I've said it before, and I will say it again, the best weekend of racing ever. Obviously, we had IndyCar and F1 racing for the biggest day in racing, but we also had a really good product at the 600 that we have not seen in years, and that was really special to be at in person. There was constant passing, and if you thought a driver had the lead, give it 10 to 20 laps because the driver right behind him would reel him in and go for the lead himself, and that was super exciting to watch, especially the Larson and Briscoe kind of tussle near the end of the race when Briscoe was trying to catch him, couldn't quite get there, tried to catch him, couldn't quite get there, and then he spun out, and then chaos ensued with those overtime restarts, but that was incredibly exciting, and it had me up from my seat and down from my seat, just kind of seeing if Briscoe could potentially get a 600 win. That was exciting within itself, but overall, I did not want the racing to end, like I said earlier. And for that reason alone, I have to give this race one of the highest ratings we have ever given out on above yellow line. And yes, I said bias might come into factor, but the product itself was absolutely phenomenal. I have to give this race a 98% above the yellow line, making this the highest rated race on the above yellow line scale next to the 2021 Cookout Southern 500 at Darlington. So that is my race rating. Let me know yours in the comments below. But now it's time to preview this coming week's race at Worldwide Technology Raceway or Gateway as we know it with the Enjoy Illinois 300, starting with your track facts and driver stats presented by Rhino.co. The track length for Worldwide Technology Raceway is 1.25 miles long. The race length is 482 laps or 300 miles. Stage one is 45 laps. Stage two is 95 laps. And the final stage is 100 laps. Now for the driver stats, they're a little bit different this week as the Cup Series has never actually raced at this track. So we're going to kind of pull from prior stats based on the Xfinity and Truck Series numbers that correlate to the drivers that we have currently in the Cup Series. So the last driver to win at the track that is now currently in the Cup Series was Brad Keselowski in the Xfinity race in 2010. He actually won it in a Dodge. And then finally, the active driver with the most track wins is technically Kevin Harvick if you combine his truck and Xfinity wins at this track with three. Let's close it out with our two watch to worry for this weekend at Gateway. Now, I, I'm going to kind of give myself cop-out answers for this because I never got to watch them race at Gateway, though I know some Cup Series drivers have raced there before, as I mentioned in our driver stats. So the guys I'm going to be worried about, it's going to be everybody. <laughs> Nobody knows how they're going to do in this Gen 7 car at a new track for the Cup Series circuit. So I'm going to be worried about everybody. How are they going to do? Are somebody going to fall below the cutoff line? Will somebody rise to the occasion and get their first win? It could be a very interesting weekend. So... I guess maybe not, I don't, maybe I don't have worries more so that I have curiosity going into this weekend, but now for our guys to watch. Like I mentioned earlier, there are drivers that have raced here before in their Xfinity and Truck Series careers. I'm going to be looking at the following guys, Kevin Harvick, Bubba Wallace, Brad Keselowski, Ross Chastain, Cole Custer, Justin Haley, Kyle Busch, and Christopher Bell. All the guys that have won at the track before. 
I want to see if they can carry some of the knowledge that they got from their race wins at this track and if they can carry it over to the Gen 7 car. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case, so that's why I'm a little bit worried. But still, if you want at this track, you kind of have it figured out. So let's see if these drivers can figure it out this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway or Gateway as we know it. So who are your two watch, two worries for the weekend? Maybe you have better picks than me. Let me know in the comments below. And with that, we are done with this episode of Above the Yellow Line, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series. Make sure to join our live stream this Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern time to discuss our week at Charlotte. Also doing some show and tell. You can probably see some new set pieces in the background that I am very excited about. We'll be showing you all what we got, what we experienced, what we saw at Charlotte. So make sure you tune into the live stream on Friday. Also be on the lookout for a vlog from my experience, plus maybe a Cup Series driver interview coming up in the next week or two. So stay tuned, all of this on this YouTube channel. So to follow all the action from us here at Above the Yellow Line, make sure to check out our social pages on Twitter at underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore. For post-race polls and daily questions and Above the Yellow Line on the Instagram and YouTube for teasers on our upcoming projects and more options to get in on the conversation. Also, make sure to check out tobychristy.com on all social platforms to find great motorsports content and tobychristy.com to hear and read more from the teams and your favorite drivers. I also have to give a huge thank you to SRI Performance, PFC Brakes, Rhino.co, and DoorDash for supporting Above the Yellow Line and all of us here at tobychristy.com. Finally, before we go, I wanted to say that we reached 1,000 subscribers on the tobychristy.com YouTube channel, so thank you all so much for getting us to that number and to thank you all for that and supporting us here at tobychristy.com. We're going to do a little bit of a giveaway. I'm going to announce the rules and the prizes this Friday during the live stream, so if you already were kind of hesitant on joining the live stream or if you were already going to join anyways, more of a reason to join in on the conversation there. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Official rules will be posted following that live stream. So make sure you check that out. But in the meantime, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this with your friends and family. And guys, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Above the Line. And until next time, I'll see ya.